not a full room. So. Yeah. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Campus Conversation. This is the third of this academic year. I am Aisha Elamine, the Associate Provost. Uh, Provost Susan Poser was unable to be here today. The goal of Campus Conversation series is to have faculty, students, and staff engage with each other about some big issues of our time, going on now and affecting all of us. As a community get dedicated to social justice and diversity, we come together to try to understand current events and talk about the issues. Over the past three years, we have looked at issues such as immigration, civil rights, national and local elections, and the hashtag MeToo movement. Upcoming programs, uh, some, some of the programs for the year also included free speech on campus, climate change, and coming up Mayor Lightfoot's year, first year in office. Today the topic is what's going on and why, food insecurity on campus, causes and solutions. We know that there are growing issues of food insecurity at our colleges and universities. We also know that these insecurities are part of a larger system. What we may not know, which I hope we know after today, is that there is a solution. Today we have Dr. Evelyn Figueroa to lead a panel to address the issue of food insecurity on campus. She is here, here with her colleagues, Wendell Gray, Winnell Gray, I'm sorry, okay. Carol Patters Peterson, and Taylor So. These are all experts in the field. So I'll start by introducing our panel and then I'll let our moderator take over. They'll each speak to you um, for a total uh, collectively of 45 minutes, after which we'll have 30 minutes for questions and answers. On your chair, there's a piece of paper and a pencil for you to write down your questions. Please write them down um, as we get close to the Q&A portion of the campus conversation, and we'll collect those questions and provide them to the panel. Our moderator, Dr. Evelyn Figueroa, is a professor. She's at UIC Family Medicine Residency Program Director and the director of the UI Health Pilsen Food Pantry. Dr. Figueroa, and I'm, I'm just tripping over this name. I'm so sorry, Evelyn. Figueroa. Figueroa, thank you so much. And I said, like, I said it five times beforehand, but that she didn't did. quite, she tried so quite, hard. quite work. Um, it's never happened before. <laughs> never. Never. <laughs> she founded and, direct, and now directs the UI Health Pilsen Food Pantry. And she serves as volunteer medical director for the specific Garden Mission Homeless Shelter and Medical Clinic, and was recently inducted as a fellow into the Institute of Medicine Chicago. In addition, she is the executive co-director of the Figueroa. Figueroa Wu Family Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose work focuses on social medicine and outreach. Winnell Gray is the family coach for the Chicago Housing Authority. Right here. Uh, we have Carol Peterson, who is the director of the UIC Wellness Center. And last but certainly not least, we have Taylor So. He's a medical student and UI Health Pilsen Food Pantry volunteer. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody. So I'm Evelyn Figueroa from Family Medicine. And I was going to start with a few slides just introducing you to our topic. I'm very happy that food insecurity is getting the attention uh, that it's getting now, and especially on college campuses. I know the city of the city of Chicago um, colleges have now all committed to having food pantries. It's a it's a highly pervasive issue that seems to get um, get uh, bandwidth at a community college sort of level, but us being um, more forward and having a food pantry at UIC since 2014 with Carol Peterson really is is advanced. 
for other schools. So I'm, I'm very happy about this. We have a few um, pictures just to try to get you to think about it. A picture of the pop-up pantry. The right side is at uh, in the middle of a giant delivery day at UI Health Pilsen Food Pantry. And then what's in the middle there? What's the picture in the middle? What was it? Food waste. Food waste. It is a landfill. What is the most uh, abundant thing in landfills? Food. So um, this is a really like the solution is is I think everybody knows there's a there's a there's a feasible solution to this, but it really involves us thinking a lot differently about food. So there was a great article that came out this year, and I teach bias in healthcare. Um, and as residency director, I really want my residents and my trainees to be socially aware and develop interpersonal and also systemic advocacy skills. That really extends a lot farther than being able to write a prescription, right? It can't just be that you can write a great prescription that you understand which insulin to give um, to people with different types of sugars and things like that. Because if you don't understand the context and the world that the person lives in, all the insulin prescriptions in the world are going to do nothing. And we're really at this amazing time in medicine where um, other, other, um, other healthcare systems that have much stronger social infrastructural support are, are finally being um, acknowledged as being good examples of what, we're able, what we could be able to do in the United States, right? We spend twice as much money and, get, and, and do not get the health outcomes. On average, we spend $10,000 for the health of each American in the United States, but we rank 37th depending on the year. We're the lowest first world country, right, health-wise. And that's because we're ignoring this giant elephant in the room, and these are social determinants. So whether they're social determinants of health, of education, it's, it, these are things that change how your whole life could be. So this article came out, um, and, it, and it, hit, uh, you know, it hit Associated Press and all of these places. Everyone was picking it up, and it was the byline was a tale of two cities. Are you guys familiar with this article, where they were comparing Streeterville to a street in Englewood, and they showed a bigger gap than you can even find on the Chicago Health Atlas. So this is, of course, a beautiful view from Streeterville, where people have abundant access. And then I didn't put the picture of Englewood, and I wanted you all to think about the reasons why health is different. Do I prescribe a different insulin in Streeterville than I do in Englewood? I don't. I use the exact same insulin. I use the exact same blood pressure medicine. It's all the same medicine, but there are other barriers that get in the way. So we have to think very differently about this, and we have to normalize this conversation about social determinants. And it often makes people uncomfortable because the first social determinant that you can think about is race, right? That's the one that we lump everybody into boxes, even though, who knows, it's a huge construct. But these, these pictures, and I thought it was, you know, finding these, this data is always sobering and invigorating for me because it motivates me a lot to think, to think about things differently and to challenge like the medical status quo. This is stuff that's typically humanities in medicine. It's not mainstreamed enough. The students are hungry for it, but those of us that are older in medicine just got used to talking about medicine a certain way. And we're we're special. We're doctors. You know, it's, we did all this really hard school, so we have to show we're smarter than everyone. And it's the solutions are not being smarter and doing a pan, you know, pancreatic islet cell transplant. That is not the solution to fixing this. It's about making neighborhoods safe and making services accessible. So the left picture is a food insecurity map from um, the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And if you want to transpose that food insecurity map on the shootings, you will see that food insecurity is it literally, you could overlay the two maps and violent crimes directly correlate with food insecurity. Why? Because it has to do with, with the root causes of all of these, which is poverty, right? And unequal access. And people that are just really struggling with their immediate needs and not able to move ahead. And then the middle slide is just a very sad slide that, um, that came up through um, census data um, less than 10 years ago. And it was spending per student by race of school. So. Um, the brown rate, the brown and black folks are the red, the red bars, and majority or mixed is the blue bar. And and why is that in Chicago? Do you guys know why that in Chicago, school spending would be directly correlated? It's because uh, property taxes, right, directly feed into it. So the the areas that have undervalued properties are not going to have, and areas that are over, and they don't share it. It doesn't work that way. There isn't a pool 
you have your place, I have my place, I protect my school. So, because not, we're not necessarily community centered when we're thinking about designing the city. We still in, are very independent neighborhoods. And there's, there's something to be said for community. And I do understand about keeping resources in one place, but it's kind of shocking when you look at the statistics and what happens. And it translates back to that life expectancy where you have unequal resources and things change differently. So I did several, these are um, service areas for UI Health. I'm a family physician, so I see a lot of people from around here and then they do extend. So 60621 is Englewood, up 60611 is Streeterville. I added those in for the slides, although Englewood is one of the bigger um, UI Health draws. 60612 is, um, is where our campus is for the medical school and the hospital. Then you have Lawndale, 2-3, two, um, two, um, et cetera. So when I tried to get you guys to see just how you can cross over just literally a street. I know that this geo mapping is, we're all looking at this, but it's really how do you have these conversations? How do you sit next to someone that you're in class with or a different professor and really make this a central part of the argument because it's integral to whether or not students can achieve. So to bring you back, you have still again social determinants. And you have, you have to think about that whole rainbow that we do, talking about kind of the different things that contribute to people's wellness. And if you look at health, you can also think about education. If someone's not healthy, it's going to be a lot harder. We're an institution that embraces diversity, but do we make sure, like, what does that, what does that diversity look like and what does health look like? It, does it mean that we, leave, that we leave no one behind, that some people can be left behind? What resources do we, do we allocate and how do we make sure of the fidelity of the delivery of those resources. So when I think about food insecurity, I thought I was inspired by this pantry that was um, in San Diego that was connected with the health clinic. The UI Health Pilsen Food Pantry is the, um, is the first open access medical food partnership in Chicago. So you don't have to be a UI Health patient. You don't have to be a medical student or a college student or anyone that's associated with our health system or our university system. You can be anyone. Because if you're food insecure, you probably have other things that are happening to you, right? And we need to be cognizant of that. So this, this all relates to a hierarchy of needs. I think a lot of you are familiar with this, of the, the things that you're gonna solve before you move up. And if you wanna think about where education goes, think about where education is. Education's literally at the top. You're not going to work on your education if you don't have somewhere to sleep, if you don't have clean water, et cetera. It is very distracting to not have these things. And you know, if you're a parent and you're living in Detroit, in, in today still, I mean, I don't know how people can just normalize that this is just a way that we live. So similarly, if you're looking at a crime, rat, um, a crime map, that means that people aren't going to have access to go out and exercise outside. These are all obvious things you all know. But we really disconnect when we talk about people and we objectify them. So where does education play into this? And why does this matter at our university? Because we should be pretty resourced. We're a university, right? Our students must be doing well. So we have a ton of first generation students. We have a disproportionate number of first generation students. And we have a large number of students of color at our university proudly and other groups, right? We, um, we focus on disability studies. We have giant um, LGBTQ presence at UIC. That's, that's important because these are marginalized groups that have less access. So if you're first generation, you're more likely to first not get to university to start in um, community college. Um, you have lower graduation rates. You're more likely to take loans, be part-time, have dependents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what, how does that translate to whether or not a person is going to be able to afford healthy food, have the books they need, have a safe place to sleep every night, have inter uninterrupted sleep, have reliable transportation, et cetera, et cetera? Well, you know the answer, right? Because we have a lot of wraparound things that UIC does to try to support students, and yet we have to decide where our priorities go and, and allocate um, accordingly. This is um, the upper left is the ethnic diversity. Um, so you have the, the, um, the red bar is Latino, the green bar is black, um, the teal bar is white. So you have, you have a very, compared to other universities, a much more diverse, and they actually have that in overall diversity score. Th those of you who, work, who are faculty are familiar with this because these are numbers that we keep 
and the national average is the red in the, the red bars. So if you look at ethnic diversity, the red bar where under 50% um, are, identif you know, are identified as, as super diverse, and then you have this bar at UIC that's just way more that the quotient that they get shows a much higher level of diversity. So why am I talking about all of that if I'm talking about food insecurity? Because that's what I'm supposed to be here, and I'm now I'm losing all my time. So I think you all know that food insecurity is a pervasive issue. If you're thinking about in um, nationally, it's one in eight families are food insecure. If it's Chicago, it's one in five families. It's a huge issue. Um, and there is, Chicago is a food hub for the country. So it's, it's something that really does have a solution. We screened when we started our pantry in Pilsen and found a disproportionately, like alarmingly high rate of food insecurity in our patients that if you went on the greater Chicago map, didn't reflect that. But that probably reflected a lot of the gentrification. I always make the joke about, that you talk about college, talk to college students about eating a lot of instant noodles, needing to be on this cheap diet, but it's really us normalizing food insecurity and almost um, condoning it. So rather than us learning how to navigate, we have, again, this is a food hub. We throw away 40% of the food that we produce in the country. We don't have to have students living off of ramen when you know that every year that your food insecure increases your risk of developing diabetes by 10% and decreases your life expectancy. So I think, I think you all know that there are um, really uh, predictable food insecurity risk factors, people with children, so we have UIC students that are more likely to have dependents, um, households that are led by single parents, that's more common, um, people of color in typical underrepresented minority groups. These are, these are very, um, these are common things that we see here, and I think you almost get so used to it. So, and the other part that's fascinating about food insecurity really has to do with what people can afford. So will you buy the, the pint of raspberries that costs $4.50, or will you buy you know, your genetically modified cornflakes and buy three pounds of it? You're gonna buy the cornflakes, right? And if you're a kid that's never tried different foods, are you, if you, if you really, if you end up with sour raspberries that the kid hates, you've just wasted $4.50, so you're probably never gonna buy that again. So there are all these other layers of it that we don't think about. We don't think about that you have to make two different meals if you're trying new food in a family that's food insecure because the kid rejects it. So you go for safe things and you build this terrible cycle of where there isn't a lot of variety in what you eat and we don't, um, and then we end up making a lot of unhealthy behaviors. So like for instance, people will talk about thinking that people have an oversupply of nutrition when they're obese, but it's typically in someone who is um, impoverished, it's actually an imbalance. So they, the calorically dense foods are, are like this. So this happens to your college students too, and if you don't address it when they're younger, it's much harder when you're 46. I mean, I'm never gonna get back into that size six. It's just never gonna happen. <laughs> but I did when I was young, and if you're starting already where it's, it's less healthy, all your, your, your hereditary factors don't help. So those are some pictures from our pantry. We have all sorts of stuff. We have eggs and milk and frozen meat, and we have oil and vinegar decanter. We have herbs that we pack up. There are rice and beans, just lots and tons and tons of produce. And we get our food from um, a number of different places. We do about 25 grocery store and wholesaler rescues for food that was gonna go into the garbage. Um, and then we get Greater Chicago stuff, which is also um, from oversupplied because a lot of the food that we get is oversupplied again because we overproduce so this is what our pantry looks like you can see a very big bump in october presumably from the school strike right because we have these food insecure people so it was really bananas um, fortunately i could make my son who was involved with the food strike come i'm sorry the school strike volunteer more um, I'm sure he was thrilled. Um, besides that, the service, we, this is a really good microcosm for service learning. This is a place where students, I think, are gonna develop greater empathy and uh, remember why they are going into serving professions. So we have a number of relationships with the undergrad and with the community. I have a medical student rotation now that's for a clinical student to work on advocacy so that they um, develop greater navigational skills and just develop greater comfort with having these conversations. 
And that really, that really requires you to d develop more wraparound services. So a couple weeks ago, one of the other panelists helped us, helped us throw a giant, our second annual community party for Halloween. This was really nice, so the kids would just have something fun to do normalizing. It's very stigmatizing to be um, food insecure. People often confess to you while they're waiting, saying, I never thought I would be like this. I never thought this would happen to me. And you really want to give, you want to just let everyone understand that this is a problem with a solution. We have too much food. We're here just to share the food with you. It's not to help you. You're doing me the favor. Thank you. And um, over on the left, we have um, a little library that we started this summer because, of course, child, child literacy um, directly correlates to upward mobility in life. Um, and then we have a number of community projects that we work on. We, t um, we move over 40,000 pounds of food a month at our pantry. It is, it is small but mighty. We're open five days a week. Um, and, um, and so like we talked about, um, just looking at, um, just for food, food insecurity and why, why this is an important discussion for physicians to have. A lot of people will say, why would a doctor start a food pantry? And I always say, why wouldn't a doctor start a food pantry? We know how to write reports. We know how to fill out papers. We're really good at those things. And this is a way um, to use the data to compel people to understand this is everybody's problem to find a solution for. This starts in childhood. And this is something we could be, and we could really be anti. Um, poverty and anti-barrier with. So we're back to the picture of the landfill and um, and then the left side is a picture of us rescuing at Whole Foods. So you know you're trying to get the food not to go into the landfill and you're trying to move the food into the pantry into um, into hungry mouths and into families that need it. So um, this is the stuff we do with the students just with wraparound services because you have to get more comfortable having this. We use a website called ampertha.com to find stuff. It's a free website. And this is our last slide. And I really want, like, when we're thinking about food insecurity and we're talking about social determinants, to think about, like, if we want these things to change, it really requires all of us to, to recognize that this is a real issue, that this is an issue that has a solution that if we can normalize talking about what people need and screening people rather than waiting for people to be in crisis mode, we would, we would have much better impacts and outcomes. And the whole part about discussing social determinants with your peers is just being able to do that. If someone, like I often have, when I have volunteers that come, I talk to them about, if you need to stay for food, please stay for food. And here and there you get a taker. But you can see that people can be very, very um, uncomfortable. So I screen all of my students. If they mention ramen noodles, because I don't allow ramen noodles in the pantry, like that's, for me, that, that's like, oh, you need to take food home today. You can register, you'll get your food. So, um, and that was for me. So, thank you. There's your picture, Taylor. I put you up. So. Oh, I'm me too. I think, Carol, you're next. Yes, why now is there at our party? Okay. I think you're there. You are. Great. Thank you, Carol. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Carol Peterson. Can you hear me okay? Yes. My name is Carol Peterson, and I am the director of the Wellness Center. And I just want to give you a little bit of history and background about the pop up pantry. So, um, as they mentioned, I founded the uh, pop up pantry in 2014, and the story behind that is basically I was doing a, a standard individual consultation with a student and he happened to casually mention that he was hungry. And then he told the story that the reason that he was hungry is because that morning he was reaching for a box of cereal and his mother told him to put that cereal back because she was that was the last bit of cereal that they had in the house and she had to save that cereal for his sister. So literally, if you look at this situation, this story from the perspective of the mother, she was almost like that movie Sophie's Choice where she had to decide which of her children she was gonna feed. And she had to choose the younger sister because probably from a parental perspective, she realized that this was a young growing child and that needed them food the most. So in other words, he came to a school hungry. That really inspired me and showed me that this was a problem going on in campus. And the more that I talked to students, the more that I saw that. 
So in 2014, I started the pop-up pantry, and I was assisted by Brandon Gaskew at that time, who was the vice president of undergraduate student government. Together, we worked together, and we made it happen. I continue the work for this up to this day. So it's a, a, truly a labor of love. It's literally like a second part-time job, but it's one that I love. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a data about the pantry. So on average, we're, doing, we're sending, seeing anywhere from like 80 to 100 students a week. We give out about 5,000 to 8,000 bags of groceries uh, a year. Um, we are open every week. We're open every Wednesday, every Thursday from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Uh, what we did is we wanted to make access to the pantry and its food super easy, so when students walk in, they do fill out a form, but it's a really quick intake form, and we're gonna, I'm gonna share data with that intake form with you. They fill out a quick intake form, and because we are a member of the Greater Chicago Food Depository, they also fill out a quick intake form with them. So I also wanna say that UIC, that our, that our pop-up pantry was the first university in the state of Illinois that got to be a full member of the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And that was because they came and watched our operations and liked what they saw and then gave us this membership. So that's truly an honor that they were able to do that with us. So what I'm gonna do at this point is I've got um, a slideshow for you and I apologize, I'm gonna be reading the slides to you. Um, so it'll just help me stay on track. And I'm very, please ask me questions too as after we're done with this. Okay, so. Uh, let's look at food insecurity and as it is defined. So the USDA government actually redefined it. Initially they were calling it food insecurity and non-food insecurity, but now they've like really drilled down. So what they have is low food security and very low food security. So low food security is basically you have food, but it's not necessarily what you want. So it might not be the variety that you want, the type of cut that you want. You have food, but it's not what you want. And there is no issue no issue with reduced food intake. When you have very low food security, there is an issue with food intake. It's low food intake or no food intake, and hence that is that, that difference. It's not the issue of I have food, but it's not what I want. It's the issue of I don't have food. There's also disrupted eating patterns that go along with very low food security. Okay, so why the cause of very low, for low food security among college students? So there's a lot of different reasons. Dr. Figueroa hit on a lot of ones. I have more up here, as you see. The, the point is, like, even for what is on this slide, there's many other d reasons that, you know, we have food insecurity. We also, like, domestic violence is one of the reasons why. So a domestic violence incident could occur, you leave, now you're homeless, now you're food insecure, or you're couch surfing. So there's a lot of varieties why. The picture that you see is actually of UIC students. Um, this represents an early pop-up pantry. We used to be on the sixth floor. We used to do this once a month. And what this picture shows is what a typical pop-up pantry during those early days looked like. Now this line was a long line. If you're familiar with the sixth floor, this line went all the way back to the elevators and went to the right around the corner and then continued on past 613 to the wall and even looped around. This was a very long line. And here's the thing that almost makes you wanna cry. Students were patient. The room that we were given at that time could only fit three to five students at a time, so shoppers. So imagine each student taking 10 to 15 minutes to shop. Imagine 50 to 75 students waiting in line. That means you're waiting for over an hour and students were patient. As students moved in and out of the pantry, they would stand up, walk over one or two seats, and sit down. Now, we did what we could to make an intolerable situation tolerable. We had fun party music playing. We had snacks to give them. We made it as lively as we could. But the point is, is that for them to show such patience and commitment to staying showed that there was a true need. So we talk about US, uh, US poverty. So U.S. Poverty Guidelines in 2016. So this is a very interesting slide to me. So you see that one person on average was 11,000 for poverty level, two people was 16,000, and then you look at the average poverty level for a college student and that's about $14,000. Again, recognizing that there's a pendulum and it sways um, and that, that this is literally just an average. I think the important point about this is that because students are making $14,000 and $11,000 is the cutoff point for poverty level, this means that even though they are poor, they're too rich to be able to apply for some social service needs because they're too rich. 
even in their poverty. So what I, the next two slides are gonna look at uh, intake forms for the, US, for the UIC pop-up pantry. So when students come in, what I do is I have an intake form that they, that they do, and there's a variety of questions. I don't have all of the questions here because it would just be too much data. I tried to pick things that were the most interesting to kind of jump out at you. Um, it just takes a few minutes, but what my goal in having this, this, this intake form was to kind of understand who they were at the point in time that they were standing at the front desk of the wellness center. It's sort of that snapshot of need, and that's what this shows. So our first snapshot of need, how did you hear about us? As you see, 57% said a friend, 13% uh, said staff, 11% said faculty. That makes complete sense. As you know, students talk to each other. Um, they know all of their other friends who are equally in need as they are, and so they're quick to share resources. So it makes sense that 57% is, is friends. And as for the data regarding faculty and staff, those numbers over the years have actually gone up. So that's a good thing. It just also means that we need to work harder on our end, on my, when I say our end, I mean my end, literally as the runner of the pop-up pantry, communicating with staff and faculty to say, hey, we're here, and make sure that your students know. So it's not a bad thing, it's just I'm, I'm seeing growth there. Outside resources, so we asked our students, where else are you going to get help? What really surprised me when I first asked this question years ago was that 105 students, 13% uh, were saying that they were using link cards. Until that point in time, I had never even conceived of our students using or needing link. 8% were using other pantries. That's 69 of our students were using other pantries. 1.2% shelters. When I say shelters, that means that 12 of our students, so at this point, for this is showing one year, last year, at last academic year, about 900, about 900 students answered the survey. That means 12 out of almost 900 students of our UIC family were going to homeless shelters to get food. And as you know, that's a, a, a um, a safety factor, right? And it's also just um, a very scary place for a student to have to go. I mean, you come to class one minute, and the next minute you're in a homeless shelter. That's talking about two different worlds. So the next question is talking about how often in a typical week are you hungry? How many, day, how many days in a typical week are you going hungry? What this shows is that 64% out of that ni almost 900, 64%, which is 521, were saying that they were going one to two days of interrupted food take, reduced food take, or no food take. Three to four days, 14% of the students said that they were not eating three to four days out of the week. That 14% was, was 118 students were saying that they were not eating three to four days. The last one we're showing is 3%. It's saying five to seven days. How many? times are you missing food? We had students that said five to seven days out of the week, which is seven days, I'm not getting the food that I need. I'm going hungry. So that 3% really represents 24 students. To me, that number is too high. Our next slide, again, this is from an intake form of almost 900 people. So we, so we're, so we asked the question, who, is it, who are you sharing this food with? So 22% said their family. They're sharing it with their family. Family is, is mom, is dad, is siblings, um, their own children. Um, I, 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 I read stories about parents being unemployed or underemployed or we, um, I'll read you some at the end, I've got some comments to share with you, but uh, one student said that he shares it with his mom because they live in a large family of five, the mom's a single mom, it's hard for them to make ends meet, so they take food from the food, our food pantry and take it home to help share it with their families, which is amazing. 45% also say roommates. You'll often see roommates coming in together, getting enough food to help them all manage and have something to eat. So access to food, um, how does it help you? So 75% said that it helps to reduce stress and worry. Again, 75% saying stress and worry. That's 618 students. We also had about 400 or so talking about that it helps them to focus, that it helps them to learn. And we're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at food in the brain in a, in a quick second. Current food in your house, because remember I wanted to know what was the snapshot? Where were you when you were standing in front of my desk filling out this intake form about to shop? So the, food, the question is, how much food is in your house right now? 
So 40%, which is 329 students, said at the point of intake, they only had zero to five items of food in their house. 41% said they had six to 10 items in their house. There was 341 said that they had six to 10 items in their house. Now I want for you to think about how much food you have in your home right now, especially at the point of Thanksgiving, people are starting to stock up. Those numbers are gonna be high, 100 items, 200 items. And, and we have students in our classroom who are zero to five items. So, so usually what I see when I look at the literature, they always talk about food insecurity. They talk about it from the perspective of hunger, but what I wanted to do was talk about, are you telling me, okay. <laughs> they uh, talk about the perspective from the brain, like brain function and recognizing these are students who have, um, where their brain is their greatest asset. So I've been given the warning sign, so forgive me, I'm gonna go through this super quick. So our brain has 85 to 100 billion neurons. So essentially, it's the same thing as the universe. There's billions of universes, that's in your head, right? 85 to 100 billion. Each neuron has approximately 2,000 to 7,000 synapses. So you have like literally creating trillions of connections. So during cognition, each synapsis fires during cognition, each synapse fires 200 times per second. 200 times per second. So when you're engaged and your beta waves are going and you're learning and you're listening and you're processing, 200 times per second, your brain is using this energy. So the brain uses 20 to 30% of the body's total caloric energy. If you're eating a 2,100, 2100 uh, calorie diet, it's eating using 20 to 30% of that. The brain uses 20 to 30% of the body's total oxygen. So exercising, feeding the brain is a huge, wonderful thing. So pop quiz, which gives your brain the most oxygen, running or walking? Walking. So walking, you're breathing in deeply, but you're, you're not using all of it on your muscles. When you're running, you're using so much oxygen just to keep those muscles uh, oxygenated. So again, taking a walk activates and oxygenates your brain. So research shows that nutritional deficits are associated with the following, lower grades, higher rates of absenteeism, repeating a grade, inability to problem solve, inability to focus, which is what our students reported, slower memory recall, behavioral issue, issues, and hyperactive and attention problems. What this shows are some of the comments from students that we have, and please allow me to share this with you. I'm a poor college student with no job, so I spent most of my time being broke. I usually can't find food at home or UIC, so I really appreciate the pop-up pantry. Thanks so much to everyone who donated. It really, helps being, it really helps being able to bring and have food for my family. It has been a rough time for us and this helps alleviate the weight off of my shoulders. Thank you. My husband is an unemployed veteran. My part-time job is for both of us and this helps a lot. Thank you. I have two small kids at home that depend on me. Although I make sure they are fed, this will help out. So I just wanted to share with you the voices of some of our students and just to let you know that we are moving forward and the reason we're moving forward is thanks to the community of UIC, the faculty, staff, and students who do food drives on our behalf. Thank you so much. Now, would you like to um, talk into the microphone and tell them what you do and sure. why it matters? About sure. Hi guys, my name is Warnell Gray and I am a family coach slash therapist slash uh, ground worker for the Chicago Housing Authority for an agency I call Employment and Employer Services. And I work out of a housing development called the Dearborn Homes. So I get to actually do the groundwork and see uh, all these things that Carol and Evelyn are just speaking about homes that have zero to five pieces of food in their refrigerator, uh, families who are choosing which child they're going to feed. Um, I also get to uh, talk to the, these families and encourage them and give them resources about food pantries, about choosing colleges that have pop-up pantries um, so that they won't have to struggle and make that choice of who they're going to feed. Um, I also get to uh, uh, be a resource to students and uh, families to let them know that um, 
if they need help, they don't have to be embarrassed to go out and get it. So I actually do home visits. When I go into the home, because a lot of families, like my family, when I was growing up, my mom was a parent of, um, single parent of five, who we suffered food insecurity. And my mom was afraid to go out and get resources. So that's one of the reasons why I chose a profession that I, that I did. Um, but I get to go into the homes and have a real discussion with the families about un unemployment or employment, about health, about you know, what they can do and actually give them the resources that they need. Um, being a family coach, we don't tell the families what to do, but we do encourage them and kind of coach them and let them be the driver um, of the information that we do give. Um, so I make it a point every day to uh, make sure I have the, re the correct resources and enough resources to service our families um, down in the Dearborn Homes with information as of the Pilsen Food Pantry and now information about UIC Pop-Up Pantry. Um, so I get to just really work one-on-one uh, -on -one with these families. Yeah, and why now? What's been great is um, we, so I talked about that if you're doing food insecurity, there are these wraparound services that you have to understand. So for instance, we had a, an immigrant family that we were trying to find furniture for. Wynella is a wealth of information. She told me about a, a, a furniture bank yeah. that we could get new mattresses for the family. Like, so that they weren't using mattresses that they weren't sure about, et cetera. It's really, it's, it's amazing the types of resources. In Chicago, there are so many resources. The issue is the navigation and the vetting. And, and like Evelyn said earlier, uh, food insecurity doesn't just start, start or stop at not having food. It starts at not having a job, not having the education to get the job that you need, um, health, not having the, the energy to get out, and even mental health. Discrimination. Not, yeah, discrimination, definitely. Um, you know, and not having the resources. And I think that's really where the food insecurity starts. Um, we can start to eliminate that as get, help people get the resources that they need in order to get the food that they need. Taylor, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your time at the food pantry and now how you're transitioning that knowledge into medical school? Sure. So uh, first I just want to say it's, uh, it's very humbling to be up here with such uh, inspiring women. Um, I, what, I, what I can maybe add is uh, a pantry is only as uh, strong as its volunteers. Uh, there, there have been days um, where uh, it, we bring in uh, 2,000 pounds of food and we have, to, we have to put it all in the fridge uh, before we start serving the clients. And sometimes the clients are waiting for, uh, for hours on end to be able to get the food. So uh, whenever we have uh, all hands on deck, it's very, very helpful. So if, uh, if anyone has uh, free time between uh, 12 and 4, Monday through Friday, I strongly encourage uh, volunteering at the Pelson Food Pantry. Um, as a student, I, I know the, the schedule, uh, it can get kind of uh, uh, hectic very fast and unpredictable, but if uh, you can find uh, 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 it's time um, during the weekdays, and then I know there's also um, opportunities on the weekends as well. So I, is that information available? It is on the website. On the website, so if, if you have a chance, uh, check it out. Just Google Pilsen Food Pantry. Um, and, what, and what Taylor's talking about, so we did an impact survey that I ran through really, really quickly and they wanted us, they asked for more hours for our pantry and we had already started with something overly ambitious and that was the, to be open 20 hours a week. We were very deliberate about really being respectful of people's time, having a climate controlled area where people could, um, could wait, we have a hot spot, there are all these just things that we try to provide um, at our pantry and it's still not enough. Our goal of course is to be open all the time so that, you know, because being open only afternoons is not helpful to people that work afternoons for instance, like that's, um, but you, you we're only as strong as our volunteers like Taylor says and it really does depend on that. We have one employee for the whole pantry and the rest of us are all just labors of love. So, and, and food donations really tie into that. Like we're, we're not able to, like they've asked me, it's really funny, they'll say, oh, we don't want this, you know, 6,000 pound food donation coming on Wednesday and we've tried to change it. And, and they just say, no, you can't do that. Like you, you play by Greater Chicago Food Depository's rules and you don't wanna not get the donation, but you also don't wanna close the pantry during that time. So you do everything you can to hustle and um, get as much food to as many people. 
Our pantry allows people to come twice a month, and the average food distribution is 60 pounds of food, which includes um, approximately 80 servings of fresh fruits and vegetables. So we try very, very hard to get as much of balanced nutrition as we can, including to students. <laughs> Do you have some questions, Kelsey? Great. So it looks like we're at the point where we're going to answer your questions. So I need a moment. Um, OK. Oh, I don't know this one. I'm going to give this to Carol, because I don't know that one. So I think she'll know this. OK. Oh, this is great. All right, so the first one is, uh, that I think is, is fun to do because it's a shout out to another organization that's on campus, is it says, it seems like a lot of food is wasted at events on campus. That is true. Um, what do you recommend as ways to eliminate, reduce uh, food insecurity among our students? So we're gonna have, it seems like a lot of food is wasted at events on campus. What do you recommend? So we have a food recovery um, network that has a very active chapter. They just spoke at the global, the global undergrad groups um, thing that was held right outside the Wellness Center last uh, Thursday. But you have a food recovery network that is trying very hard to work with campus events. There are a lot of strict rules about food and what you're trying to do is you're trying to offer the most balanced nutrition to folks. I don't know if you've been at a lot of these events, but often what's offered to you is the bread and um, things that have never been touched. So it's a lot of pastries in general. That's what they're trying to give. And that's not terrible, right? A little, a few bagels is okay. You know, 10 pounds of bread is probably too much to give to a household. So it's all about balance. And that tends to be what people can, you can get the most from these. If it's hot food, hot food actually has to, has a very narrow window that it has to stay at and then it has to move very quickly. Um, but I think that fixing this really starts at um, a contractual level. So the first thing is for us to all get okay with things running out at events. So the, the American concept that we're gonna have whatever we want whenever we want needs to change, right? I can get strawberries any time of year regardless of whether or not strawberries are in season. They may not taste good, but they can look really, really beautiful. Um, and we do this. This happens all the time. Every time you go to like a, like a juice bar, you always see all the different fruits that are there, even if they're completely out of season, because we get food from everywhere. We had, remember when we used to get those kiwi that were from Italy? That was like disgusting. We had like 300 pounds of kiwi, and it said from Italy. And it was, it was just, it was wasted food that we got at the pantry, and it broke my heart to think about like some laborer picking these kiwi and then putting it in a box and then no one buying it, and it was gonna go to a landfill, and our pantry got it, but it, and no one even really loves kiwi that much. So I just, it was surprising to me that it would make it so far, the poor determined kiwi. But um, it's really, it's sort of this, this concept of, of eating what's in season, eating what's local. The local farms really can't compete very well with ConAgra and Monsanto. The prices have made it very unaffordable. We have a, a partnership that's about to start between our pantry and the hospital, because the hospital is going to start buying produce from a farm in Englewood, which is a, like a back to work invigorating mm -hmm. in, and you know, investing in the neighborhood program. And they said, well, what if we get like, um, you know, like something that we're not gonna normally eat, like too much kale and we can't, we can't program the menu with it. I said, well, we'll take whatever extra kale you have. And so they wanted, the hospital wanted to do something good and invest in the community, but they really didn't have a, a place for things to go. So it's really the logistics that you have to give them and then you have to think about what you're eating at these events. Like, are you gonna have all hot dogs and hamburgers? Or are you gonna try to think about, well, if there's leftover food, could we have food that's packed in a way so that we could keep things in the refrigerator and move them on? It's, it's a lot of logistics. Um, so I think that if, the, if we were more intentional about how we write contracts, how we partner with catering at UIC, every time a new restaurant opens saying only X amount of food is allowed to go into the garbage, after that, you're taxed. So do you, have to, do you have an ad for that, Carol? Um, and you know, I think this kind of leads to the question that I have. Okay. So the question I have, it says, can you talk about the Feed the Flames program? So what I'm gonna do is sort of talk about, because part of the, this conversation is talking about solutions. And so the Feed the Flames program is one of those solutions. So I kind of, uh, leaping off of what Dr. Figueroa is saying, I want us to sort of think 
like globally. Let's think big for a second. So um, let, I want to give a shout out to the Office of Sustainability who's here, and I want to recognize that. So we have resources and programs and strategic plans in place that if we can figure out a way to like put it all together, we're going to be this awesome uh, institution rolling forward. So Office of Sustainability, I'm going to butcher this, I apologize, you guys, but basically there's a strategic plan where uh, UIC campus is supposed to be zero waste, right? This has got the attention of the chancellor, so it's this, but we're shooting for a zero waste campus. So that's, one of, that's the foundation of everything we do. The next foundation is that let us look at the resources that we have. Well, we recognize that UIC has issues with money, as everybody does, so let's look at the resources that we do have. We have access to catering, which is what Dr. Figueroa talked about. We have vending machines. When I look at the vending machines, like Farmer's Fridge, which has fresh salads, what do they do with that? Are they throwing those away? When we look at the convenience store, we've actually, I've had a student who was an eyewitness to the convenience store taking about six to 10 plastic, beautiful, brand new containers of salad and putting them into the garbage can. So we've got, talk, we have to start talking about things like that. So one of the things that the Feeding the Flames program is, it's looking at the waste, because our goal is zero waste, it's looking at the waste that's happening on campus. The Feed the Flames program is sort of a little bit of, of is food insecurity and, and also food recovery. The goal of this program, and it's at a pilot stage right now, is that the, in this building, Student Center East and Student Center East Tower, anybody who is a student affairs staff person can, when after a meeting, if there is food, they can reach out to this website, they can identify what type of food is available, the quantity of food that is available, if it's meat, if it's, if it's all vegetarian, um, and then hit a button, and then those individuals who are registered, those students who are registered to receive this information will immediately be notified. And because this isn't a pilot program, we have uploaded all of the UIC pop-up pantry participants into the system, so they're the ones who are going to be getting this message initially. So this, um, the idea of this program is the credit goes to the Office of the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs. Um, it was our vice, it was our Vice Chancellor uh, Rex Tolliver who actually brought this um, uh, idea to us, and then we are as staff are just making it happen. So right now, because it's pilot, it's just these buildings, it's just student affairs staff, it's just East Campus. At some point, our goal is to extend this to more buildings, academic affairs, and West Campus. Um, and we have had questions that say, well, can academic affairs, you know, kind of get in on this now? And I, that is my goal, is to ask that question, sort of like go up to the next level and ask if that's possible. So. The point is, in terms of solutions, we need to look at the resources that we already have that are not being utilized and that are turning into land waste. And the land waste that is happening per year is about 230 billion pounds of food is thrown away every year. And let's try to take UIC's portion back and give it to those students who are hungry and need it. Okay. So one of the questions I have is, is the food pantry accessible to the disabled? Absolutely it is. I'm the pill, I, I'd say we because I work so closely with Dr. Figueroa um, that I feel like I'm a part of the pantry you also. So pantry. <laughs> we definitely um, are uh, disabled, accessible. Uh, we, there's a door, a wheelchair accessible door to the pantry. The pantry is street level. Um, and also we have the, vol the wonderful volunteers that actually help and assist in getting the food from the shelves or the refrigerator or freezer to the carts and back out to the car or where the, where the uh, client is going. Is, um, I, is the pop-up pantry, I think, do you prop the door when it's open for the pop-up pantry? Like if, if someone was, is it handicapped accessible? I just don't remember. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I figure it has to be with a state building. Yeah, so. absolutely. So the question is, do applied health science students have access to the College of Medicine food pantry in Pilsen? And what are the hours? So uh, yes, they do. I, it, we're, uh, uh, we will serve all who come. Uh, the hours are 12 through 4, uh, Monday through Friday. We, uh, due to uh, volume, uh, we have been uh, uh, requesting that people arrive before 3.30 in order to register. 
once you're registered, it will, will serve you. And uh, as Dr. Figueroa showed in one of her slides, uh, the average uh, pounds that, uh, that people take home is about like 40? 60. 60. 60. It's, uh, it's, it's growing. So it, that's, uh, that's really exciting. So one of the questions asked, and this is a great question, what kind of food um, are most wanted for donations at the UIC pop-up pantry? So literally, um, as my grandmother would say, beggars cannot be choosy, so almost anything. Um, we are uh, mostly things that are shelf stable, so rice, um, almost anything, literally. Think about Jewel when you're walking through the aisle. Anything that you see on the Jewel shelf or, or you know, Mariano's is that shelf stable would be awesome. The only thing we don't accept are like cookies and desserts and things like that. We also have a refrigerator, so we are able to give out eggs and cheese and yogurt, but we're not asking for those items from, from folks. We get those from other places, but anything that's shelf stable. Um, because we serve a large uh, international student population, um, anything that you see on the shelf that would be of interest to a student who is an international student, you know, because as you know, food makes you feel welcome, food is comforting, and if you could see a food item on our shelf that reminds you of home, that would be awesome. Uh, so, and also on our website, we do have um, a list of things for the pop-up pantry. Um, so just quickly, since you're here right now, like peanut butter, um, uh, uh, jelly, um, rice, uh, because we also recognize that we do serve students who are homeless. Anything that is uh, microwavable, like a, like a complete unit that's microwavable, like a meal that you can just put in a microwave for those students that we serve that are homeless, that helps tremendously. One thing I think is important to know is that um, when you have a Greater Chicago Food Depository membership, you're able to afford certain foods at a much lower price point than anyone here would be able to get. So for instance, like Carol and I can get tuna for 50 cents a can, and sometimes you'll get tuna for free. So that's something that you guys can't do. It's gonna, the cheapest you're gonna get is 70 some cents. And when, you're, and when you're moving 150 cans of it a week, it adds up really quickly, the price difference. I know that it's hard to give things when you're not sure of what people are going to do with the money. Um, but Carol's a really good example that any, you know, like if you think you're gonna spend $5 at the grocery store to buy some pasta or something, you can also just donate the $5 to the pop-up pantry because her $5, she will get it much, she will extend the $5 more. A pound of oatmeal is 65 cents. Like none of you can get a pound of oatmeal for 65 cents. So. Um, so I think that's important. I know when I did uh, disaster relief in Puerto Rico, people kept sending, I took thousands of pounds of supplies to Puerto Rico and people really wanted to make sure, and it, it like the, the carbon footprint that I was creating by taking 4,000 pounds of materials to Puerto Rico was heartbreaking because the grocery stores at the point that I went, I went six weeks after Hurricane Maria were stocked but people just didn't have money to buy things. And I really wanted to invest in the local economy, but I know that there's a lot of concern that people will embezzle, and there were a lot of bad things that happened after that hurricane, so now I guess they were right to make me carry stuff over. But I do think it's it's super important for, if you, if you believe in this, to really do what you can. If you can't donate and you're using it to clear your cupboards, that's fine, that's fine to do too. There's nothing wrong with that. You thought you were gonna cook whatever it was, it didn't work out you wanna donate it to the pantry, we're very happy with that. The other thing that you can do is that there are purchase credits that you can help Carol and I afford at our pantries by actually going and volunteering at Greater Chicago Food Depository. If you go and go with your friends for like a friend's night out and you sit and you pack for three hours and we get purchase credits added back to the pantry so you could just designate the pantry as a beneficiary and it just shows up on a credit or you get a bunch of walkers for, for Carol's Hunger Walk or our group for Hunger Walk. So there are ways to do it as just like team building and bonding and um, I really, I always feel bad about asking for donations when I know that at universities um, that over 40% of students are typically food insecure, so kind of hitting the students up for donations, I, f I feel very mixed about these things. I think you can show your support in other ways. You can refer people to us for the food. Like what we want is for food to get to people and if you're able to volunteer, that you volunteer. If you can't and you're just, you're, what you're able to do is consume stuff for the pantry, we're happy with that too. Um, the one question that's, uh, there are several that are sticking out that are gonna be fun because um, it may turn into like arm wrestling, but um, 
there's one that says to just to, to when you were talking about beggars can't be choosers this is what really was perfect for this it says doesn't low food insecurity simply match every student's appraisal of dining hall food low quality variety <laughs> desirability so can you please tell me the difference between um, very low food insecurity versus food preference so that people understand this that's a great question it is that's a great question so so food preference is So very low food insecurity is, I don't have food. I don't have food. It's not the issue of, I don't like what I have, it's that I don't have it. Food preference is, I have food, but this is not what I want. So uh, you make, whoever wrote the question makes a very good point in the sense that we do have students who go to the um, cafeteria and they're not happy with what they see. For instance, here's a great example. I uh, had a, did a consultation with a student even last week, and she's from Russia. And so when she went to the food cafeteria, she was not seeing foods from home. She wasn't seeing foods that were appetizing. She was seeing things that just, you know, were not hitting the, her food needs. And so for her, that was a situation where though she had access to food, it was not food that she wanted. So, she, so in that case, you could refer to her as being like low food security. But if you have a student who's on the street or they're absolutely starving and they're not using the pantry and they don't know about these resources, that would be very low food security. And so we do have students who, though I know our catering tries very hard to do very well with the quality of food, we still have students who, who look at the offerings and, and are not happy with what they see. Yeah, and I think, I think you also have to think about people's cultural, um, cultural preferences, things that they actually will feel morally bad about eating. We have that happen at the pantry. Why now is a very good example for us. Um, one, of my, one of my residents, uh, she had low, had low food uh, security and we're to the point where she couldn't feed her family. She does, she's a Muslim, so she doesn't eat pork, or she doesn't eat red meat also, and she's allergic to whole milk. So I referred her to, actually, I referred her to the food pantry, but she didn't have a way to get there because she lives in one place, she doesn't have money to get there. So um, I went to the pantry to pick out food for her and the pantry was very uh, gracious in selecting things for her. You know, they didn't turn her away. Well, she just, well, this is what we have. We're gonna give her what, what we have. They, they did initially do well, that until I, that. We were explain going. to them preference versus well, we weren't going to talk about it's okay that. because that's important <laughs> like people will say if someone's hungry enough they'll eat anything right. and, you, and you go this person's not a dog exactly like, this is not this is not how we treat humans this so, is a real person yeah who have real needs and just because they don't or can't eat the things that you're giving giving them they still they deserve to eat yeah, you know you can't judge someone else's beliefs or value system exactly. so if that person's and and interestingly with all of the um the trade uh, the food trade and bar, um uh, barriers that have happened internationally for the united states there has been an influx of food in the pantry and you'll never guess what the most abundant meat that we're getting is at the pantry it's pork so that is, you know, so the other white meat is what we're um, constantly promoting. And that really runs into a lot of issues with families and we have to be sensitive and we also have to up train our volunteers. Taylor was incredibly value centered and client centered, but he would have to clarify with some of the, they'd be like, well, if they're really hungry and he would say, please stop. Right. You know, because the pantry is a really good opportunity for people to check themselves. Just if, because you would eat that doesn't mean that that person. We eat all sorts of bruised, cracked things in our house. We won't throw any food away. It's bananas. Like if you open our refrigerator, it's like the like food cemetery because it's just <laughs> stuff that we just feel so because we compost it, we just try to save everything. And I used to make Taylor send, you know, take home like apples if they're more than a third bruised. You know, no one will take them. I'd be like, you have to take these 10 pounds of apples. <laughs> and he'd, he'd be like, I, I don't want to. And I'd be like, please, you take them. And, it's, and it's, it's that we're all used to this. And it takes more prep. If you have something that's dented or damaged, it is harder. It's harder to cook with things if you don't know how to cook. So we offer cooking classes mm -hmm. for people. Um, this, is, um, this is really important. And can I jump in for a second? Yes. So there is, um, so talking about like the sensitivity of individuals, like I talked about, we work with a large international student population. 
And because we just work with a large population of students, we have food sensitivities that we are sensitive to. So for instance, we try to buy in, uh, items that are gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And we're very much even, not only just buying those items that are gluten-free, but we also make sure that when they're on the shelf that they're labeled as gluten-free. Mm -hmm. We have a large population of students who are vegetarian, so when we're buying items for the pantry, we're making sure that if it's a bean, if it's a soup, that it's truly vegetarian and it's being labeled as such. Because you have to make sure that like, even when you're walking into the pantry, that even though you may not have money for food, you have to be able to find food there that you can use. Because if you don't find food there and we're your last stop, if we're your last resort and you're not food, finding food that you can eat in the UIC pop-up pantry, then where do you go from that point? So we're very sensitive to that. And um, also we also recognize, like we talked about, we are um, supported 100% through donations, and so we are grateful for that, and it just helps us to continue to thrive. And actually, just uh, the point that Dr. Figueroa was making, if you um, were to volunteer at the uh, Greater Chicago Food Depository, it, you actually get $5 per hour per volunteer. It's ca 10 cans of tuna. So <laughs> if you take a group and you wanna put that group monies towards us, that's very significant. Yeah. With the um, Greater Chicago Food Depository Hunger Walk, we were able to get 363 student staff, faculty, and their family to register and walk on our behalf. And that is a great fundraising benefit for us. That brings us about $12 per person. Yes. And allow me to show you something else that we have. So the, um, the pop-up pantry, we, I, I myself, the chancellor's wife, uh, Dr. Mrs. Amaritis, the chancellor, uh, a, a student, um, student affairs, marketing, um, and also uh, wellness center staff, um, wrote this cookbook. And we did this last August, or the August before we did, um, this cookbook is filled with recipes from staff, student, and faculty. We did a call for recipes. We worked with uh, Student Nutrition Association, College of Health Applied Sciences. Um, we got recipes. We had them juried and vetted. Those recipes that passed got into this book. Um, and then what happens is now this book is for sale in the downstairs in the UIC bookstore. It's sold for uh, $14 per book, and 100% of the proceeds goes into the pantry. So this is something that we have done to help put food in our coffers, so to speak, and then also put food into students' stomach. So just letting you know that this is available, especially with um, the holidays around the corner, birthdays, anniversaries. Okay, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay doing this because it's not going to me, it's going to students. But just letting you know, um, you have to be super creative, and this is one of the things that we did. That segues kind of uh, into one of the questions that, that uh, I got about a uh, Northwestern study uh, that was uh, that found that many clients uh, were wasting fruit, food from food pantries mm -hmm. because uh, many customers uh, or consumers were not familiar with co cooking certain foods. They sold, gave away the food. And uh, the question is, how do you account for this potential problem? And uh, I think the, uh, that cookbook is a very creative solution. It's a, it, it sounds like a very cool way to go about it. At the Pilsen Pantry, I know we have a couple of uh, different avenues uh, for that. Um, some medical students were involved in a cooking class, so just uh, basically introducing some uh, basic nutrition uh, principles into ha how they cook, what they cook with, uh, things like that. And also we had a really um, proactive, awesome uh, nutrition student who did uh, kind of a uh, rotation with us where uh, she created um, recipes based on uh, the, uh, the normal uh, like food that we're getting from the pantry. And it, she made a very uh, a cool little flyer that we could give out. And if uh, a client comes in and looks at a butternut squash and says, I don't know what to do with that, we can hand them that flyer and say, oh, you just need to uh, follow these three steps. It's very tasty, I promise. I've tried it before. She even uh, brought in um, samples, and it, it, it definitely uh, cleared the shelves a lot faster. She did, and now starting in February, we're actually gonna have a dietitian student with us um, two to five days a week, depending on the week. We've been approved as a rotation site, and then the um, public health school sends, um, from the OCEAN program, sends uh, a dietitian every other week to the pantry. 
So they ask us, what are foods no one wants to eat? And we tell them, and then they build it. And that's why we have an herb shelf, and, and we have the oil and vinegar, and et cetera. Because when I visited other pantries, I was trying to imagine what you could do um, with the foods that were there, or with the ingredients. And it was very challenging for me, and I like to cook. So. And picking back on Taylor's question, um, one of the things that I do when I get uh, food from the food pantry that a lot of our residents are not familiar with, um, believe it or not, a lot of our residents don't know how to cook mm -hmm. spaghetti squash. And so what I'll do is, when I know we're going to get spaghetti squash, I'll go and print out recipes for a spaghetti squash, yeah. something that I know that they it would be easy for them to cook, and I hand it out when I hand out the spaghetti squash and encourage them to to. And you learn flavors. That. Think about how children need to try something 12, 15, 17 times before they develop a taste for it. When you're, when you're food insecure, you don't have that luxury of being able to experiment with foods. When we're doing cooking matters, they're teaching basic knife skills. If, you're, if you can buy a hot and ready pizza for five or six dollars and you can feed your family with that, you know, really not balanced, but it's, it's still, it's, it's a guaranteed. The kids will eat that pizza. It's terrible for them, but they will eat it versus you're gonna experiment with squash. Oh, my son who used to say he had a different taste of sense. He was a super taster and that's why butternut squash made him sick. And it was just all <laughs> these like concoctions you would get. You, you, you don't have that luxury of experimenting with food. And when you don't experiment, you don't develop and acquire a taste for it. You have your comfort taste. You know you're gonna like this. You know you're not throwing your money away. So we give them that. Also, Greater Chicago, and it sounds like pop-up is the same way. Um, they have us, they really encourage that people pick their own foods. You don't do food prescriptions. You don't give people a bag that has an assignment of food. It's just, it's not, they, the research is very clear that people will, they will not eat things uh, with which they're not familiar. And we try to train the volunteers to not push foods. Even if we have a million apples, they're not allowed to make someone take an extra six apples that they don't think they're going to eat. Mm -hmm. What we do is all the pantries are friends with other pantries, then we can move foods around. And that's what we do instead. We and that's true. We have, I like to call it self-determined shopping. Um, you walk in and we've set it up almost like a grocery store where you walk in and you get a basket and then you're able to grocery shop for the first time and they're able to go to look and browse the shelves which includes fresh fruit and vegetables. They're able to choose what they want to choose. Um, and as Dr. Figueroa said, we've also had uh, a nutrition, uh, we had a registered dietitian on staff who was also a graduate assistant, um, a graduate student here. And so she was wonderful for two years. Our students had access to that level of knowledge and, and consultation that she worked in the pantry and she could guide them with shopping. Um, so I, I want to, I have a question that I want to make sure that I answer because somebody was kind enough to write it, but I'm terrible. I have bad eyesight, and so Taylor's going to read the question, but I'm going to answer the question. <laughs> okay, so the question is, do the fast food chains that are in the student centers assist the pop-up pantry? There seems to be a gap in their costs and what students can afford, if at all. Here, put this question with that, because that it goes with it. Okay, this is question number two. Thank you for all uh, for being here. I appreciate the perspective and background you all shared. I noticed that there could have been another seat filled by campus dining services. I'm a current UIC staff member and alum. I was excited to see uh, what new food vendors and food service providers had contracts with the university. I was very disappointed to see my options. What role does campus dining have in offering affordable, healthy food options? How can we pressure the university to better to use better vendors. Thank you. Okay, all great questions. Um, so the it really goes back to contracts. It, you know, it really goes back to that negotiation table that sometimes happened years ago. Because right now, some of our contracts used to be that our contracts were pretty short term, but now they've been extended to seven years. And so. You know, you have to go back seven years to that point and talking about food insecurity and talking about food recovery. And to be honest, seven years ago, we weren't talking about that. So we find ourselves in a culture right now of vendors where this is not on the contract. So also knowing that sometimes you can open up renegotiations and insert something. But I'm not an expert in that. And I recognize that these are very sensitive um, uh, um, 
very sensitive times. And so I want to point to the Office of Sustainability who is sitting in the room and they have the power and the ability to be our representatives or to make power. sure there's a representative, at least I'm hoping, I'm not overstepping my bounds, to like be our representatives in that. Um, and I would even be willing to do that too. I'm the director of the Wellness Center, but I would love to be in that situation where I can make sure that the needs of our students are being attended to in those contract talks, or at least that somebody is talking about that. Because right now what's happened is we're in a place where there's lots of food, and because it's not written as a contract for food recovery or sharing or anything like that, nothing is happening. We have the need, we have the resource, but they're not connecting. Um, and you're right, somebody talked about that there's a, a gap between um, food that's a, available in the inner circle and the students' ability to pay for food. That is absolutely correct. Yeah, I mean, when we had Wendy's here, and I'm not a proponent of Wendy's, but in terms of cost, let's look at the reality. Wendy's had a dollar menu. <laughs> And so if you're making $14,000 a year and you're spending seven to $800 on living and you come to lunch, the dollar menu allows you to get some access to some food to at least have something. Again, health to me is an issue, but also not having food is also an important thing. So at least they were able to afford something. Wendy's is gone, which surprises me. As you, those of you who are familiar with the inner circle, Wendy's was the longest line. It's 30 to 40 students every day. So uh, a resource that was affordable, possibly was a contract, ended, and now they're gone. And it's been replaced by a resource that if you look at their prices are a little bit more expensive. It's fresher food, admittedly, but it's also more expensive. So the solution, the grand solution, is how do we get to the contract tables when this is happening? Who is our representative? Who represents students? Who is, you know, who do we look to for the solutions and, here? And it has a lot to do with what our values are. What's important to us? What we see as justice? Are you, you know, are we going to decide that this is a meritocracy and it's whoever can afford to go to college? You know, they have to, they just have to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and figure it out. Or are we going to all own this problem and say, we think if we want, if we really want to embrace diversity and inclusion and we want to see people move forward that have been systemically disenfranchised, how are we going to do that? And does that make it a little less uncomfortable for all of us that we all we all decide that we get rid of, you know, you get rid of Pepsi or you get rid of something that is really delicious because they won't they won't pay whatever the sustainability fee is that you eventually get written into the contracts. Can we all live with that minor bit of discomfort if it brings justice to a, a very significant portion of the students? But that all really belongs to you. So Thank you. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. It's delightful. Thank you.